One of the challenges of working with hydrographs has to do with separating the effects of precipitation on stream flow from base flow. We do this so that we can get a sense of how a watershed might respond when we put precipitation in and look at the effects on discharge as it comes out. So let's consider a few questions. First of all, what is base flow? Second, why do we need to separate base flow from effective precipitation? And third, what methods are commonly used to separate effective precipitation and that storm flow from base flow? Let's look at the relative magnitudes of the processes that contribute to a discharge hydrograph. First of all, on the very top here, we have a total stream flow hydrograph with nothing separated out. And this would be a typical hydrograph that we might see following some kind of a precipitation event, a storm, or snow melt. We have our rising limb, we have our crest, we have our falling limb, and then the recession part of the hydrograph during which the processes all return to normal after having been changed by the addition of precipitation. Most of the components of the bump in the hydrograph that represents the response to precipitation is really due to what's called Horton overland flow, or at least flow over land that quickly reaches a stream. That overland, Horton overland flow is actually added to on top of base flow. Base flow, as you'll remember, is the flow that comes slowly discharging out of groundwater reservoirs throughout a watershed. And it represents a long, gradual discharge uh, from a, a massive amount of water in general, but it's very, very slowly released. And 99% of the time, when we look into a stream, we're looking primarily at base flow, not at storm flow. There's a certain amount of precipitation that, ran that lands up directly on the channel. Uh, and this is really an insignificant portion of the hydrograph. In addition to that, we have what's called interflow, which is again much slower in response than either uh, than overland flow. It's a small component of the overall hydrograph, and though it may be somewhat significant, it really accounts for very little when we start looking at response to a storm. So hydrograph separation uh, really involves separating the storm-induced portion of the hydrograph from other processes, especially base flow. During hydrograph separation, we usually ignore what we think of as insignificant components that would include interflow and channel precipitation, and only concentrate on the two components that we think are most important. And those two would be, again, uh, base flow and the storm-induced portion of the hydrograph. Most of the techniques that we use for this are subjective, uh, but they're standardized so that different people working in different places can come up with exactly the same answer rather than having everyone develop their own technique and come up with the uh, answers that are either sub substantially or even uh, minimally different. The techniques that people apply are often associated with a watershed size, as you'll see, and part of this really has to do with how we determine things like the slope of the base flow line, etc. Some of the difficulties associated with base flow separation is that the subjectivity in some techniques leads to results that can't be reproduced by other people who are not familiar with the frame of reference of somebody who's making up the rules. Whenever we have syst sy systems in which we have some flow regulation, that would include dams or reservoirs or anything of that nature, uh, we have actually poor results because the hydrograph separation techniques that we're using usually apply to, tech to uh, unregulated watersheds. That means there's no um, no external influences on flow rates other than the geology, shape, and land cover in the watershed itself. Discharges that are really not part of the natural hydrologic cycle that can include things like sewage treatment plants or dewatering operations or flood control reservoirs are also 
uh, complicate hydrograph separation techniques in part because they add a component to the flow that really has not been associated with the natural system. And accuracy is really also highly dependent upon the period of record and the consistency of the response and changes in land use uh, in a watershed. One approach to hydrograph separation involves graphical techniques. And here we're depending upon the application of arbitrary rules to represent conditions of groundwater to stream flow. And these are often again a function of watershed area. Conceptually, they may look like this. We assume that base flow, represented here on the left-hand side with a dotted line, continues uh, with the same trend that it had prior to the precipitation event uh, until we reach the um, peak flow rate when we have bank flow and bank storage. Uh, this means flow out of the creek now into the banks uh, increasing the amount of base flow that occurs. So as we increase our bank storage during the early phase of the storm, which, which, we, which would be, we assume is prior to the uh, peak flow rate, we increase, increase bank storage and then the recession uh, or base flow curve begins to rise. And in this one is, a, is entirely a function of the uh, area of the watershed. Our intersection point from the time to peak is really re is, is related to the, uh, is, is de determined as the number of days uh, that's determined again by the number of square miles raised to the 0.2 power. The overall effect then is just this, is that prior to the time to peak, we have, we follow the base flow recession uh, curve in which we just have a little less flow in the creek every day. Conceptually, we would, whether there were precipitation or not, and, to, and finally, after the time to peak, we start to see a rise in the, in the uh, base flow amount, in part because water stored in the banks during the runoff event is actually then being released a little at a time back into the stream. And here then, the effective precipitation or storm flow amount is equal to the, the total hydrograph amount, which is here indicated by QI, at any given point, minus the base flow amount. We can do th the same thing with the semi-log plot here on the um, discharge side of the, on the y-axis. Our discharge rates are compressed by using a log scale. And in this, we essentially now carry up our, um, uh, carry a straight line across from the base to the last element of the hydrograph rise to a point of intersection and then do the same thing to um, uh, do the same thing as before but now we're, we're projecting backward on an arithmetic scale to the time to peak uh, doing this on semi-log paper and we're just really and truly fitting lines to the recession curve after the peak and then using again the same concept which is subtracting the base flow amount from the storm flow amount only this, this time it's based on a graphical semi-log plot. Straight line approach is another way of doing this. Here we can estimate the straight line uh, or the uh, base flow amount by looking at a, 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 lone, a line that's projected from the po point of the hydrograph rise to the intersection with the hydrograph using a, uh, a slope of 0 0.05 cubic feet per second times the area of the watershed uh, in miles squared. And this represents the rate of change of base flow from the time of rise to some point later on where uh, this line then intersects the, uh, the, the, the hydrograph. Uh, this is really only applicable when the area of a watershed is equal to less than 20 squ square miles. The approach we're going to take in this course is based on the application of a horizontal line. Here we pick a base flow that was in effect prior to the storm. Essentially we strike a line from the beginning of the storm flow to 
the point at which it intersects the hydrograph, and we assume that everything above that line is caused by storm flow, and everything below that line is attributable to base flow. So back to our questions. What is base flow? Base flow is the steady release of groundwater uh, over long periods of time into the stream channel. It's what we see most of the time when we look at flow in the stream channel. And why do we need to separate base flow from effective precipitation? We need to do this so that we understand something about the watershed response. That means that when the watershed when receives precipitation, we have to have some understanding of what might, ha might happen at the outlet points so that we can do things like design culverts and bridges uh, to carry water safely through without uh, damage or, or uh, even injury to people. And we looked at several methods for effects, separating effective precipitation from base flow. They included a simple graphical method uh, that was based on the area of the watershed, semi-log plot, and then the one that we'll apply in this class, which is a simple horizontal line, just a straight line from the beginning of the hydrograph to wherever it intersects the hydrograph uh, on the recession curve after, after uh, peak flow has been reached. All have their advantages, but one of the primary points to remember about these is that some depend upon the area of the watershed to define the slope of the line, and they're designed for specific circumstances and sizes of watersheds.